Hello. It is wonderful to be back in Ann Arbor, my hometown back here at the University of Michigan. I'm a documentary filmmaker, which means I'm a storyteller. So I'd like to start by telling you all a story from when I was a student here at the University of Michigan. The summer after my sophomore year, I was selected to go to Tanzania with five other U of M students to create a short documentary for the Clinton Global Initiative at a disability hospital in Dar es Salaam. When we arrived at the hospital, the six of us were taken into a small conference room, and the hospital director told us about the various issues affecting people in the hospital. This is when I was first introduced to the maternal birth injury known as an obstetric fistula, or a hole between a woman's vagina, bladder, rectum, or both, which leads to incontinence, or the inability to control your bladder and bowels. In Tanzania, most obstetric fistulas occur when women don't have access to reproductive health care. They might go into labor in a rural area and have complications, and it could take six or seven days to see a doctor. In that time, the baby's head will press up against the vaginal wall into the pelvic bone, causing tissue to die, holes to form, and often the baby loses its life. After this trauma, women are often ostracized from their communities, and because of the smell, they might be considered cursed. The good news is that there is a straightforward repair surgery available, which is exactly what this hospital was able to provide. The hospital director invited the women in our group to go and visit the women in the fistula ward who were recovering from surgery. And the day that we went, we met women from all over the country, from all walks of life and of all ages, but the woman who sticks in my mind to this very day is Sarafina. There she is. She's from the northern part of the country, and she had been living with her obstetric fistula since 1959. Until recently, when the hospital outreach staff had gone into her village looking for women in need of surgery, she had no idea there was a repair surgery available. Later in the week, the women in our group were again invited to visit a small nonprofit organization associated with the hospital called the Mabinti Center, which was training women who were recovering from their fistula repair surgery to do various crafts because many of them had been abandoned by husbands and families and didn't have a means to support themselves. When we went to the Mabinti Center, it was on the outskirts of Dar es Salaam in a small house the sun was shining and the women were beading and making jewelry. They were learning how to print and to create bags and purses. And their kids were playing in the grass and they were just laughing and talking and sharing their stories. And it struck me that the Mabinti Center was so much more than a place to learn a vocational skill. It was a place for these women to heal emotionally and spiritually after the trauma that they'd experienced. This experience had a profound impact on me for two reasons. First, for exposing me to an issue that only affects women in the developing world. And second, for formally introducing me to the power of art, creativity, and commerce to create social change. After this experience, I did not go on to become a doctor or a public health expert. I was interested not only in obstetric fistulas, but all sorts of issues that affect women in the US and around the world. I became consumed with learning about domestic violence and forced prostitution, genital cutting and child marriage, even reproductive rights, girls' education, the gender wage gap. And the more I learned about these terrible issues, the more I started to come across awful statistics, like that one in three women globally will experience violence in her lifetime or that 100 million women around the world have obstetric fistulas like the women I met in Tanzania, or that in 2017, American women on average still make just 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes for doing the exact same job. And in Michigan, that's 74 cents on the dollar. The more I learned these terrible statistics, the more I just started to feel debilitated by the numbers. It seemed like we'd been aware of these issues for decades. So if we've been aware, why haven't we moved past awareness and into real and lasting change? I believe one reason is we're not utilizing a very important resource that's present in every family, community, country, and continent. That resource is culture. Culture is anything from 
food and language to traditions and holidays, and importantly, music, dance, fashion, theater, art. Culture has a profound power to influence how we think about the world that traditional means of creating social change do not. Four years ago, all these ideas were bouncing around in my head, those terrible statistics, but also that experience I had in Tanzania, seeing the power of art and creativity to give women a second chance. Then, a friend of mine came back from a full right in India, and she told me about this incredible woman who was using dance to rehabilitate sex trafficking survivors. And suddenly, it all clicked. You see, I had been a dancer from when I was two years old, dancing right here on the Power Center stage, though definitely never for a sold-out audience, <laughs> through graduating from the University of Michigan. And I just knew instinctively the power that dance could have to help girls reclaim their bodies and get back into their bodies and learn to love their bodies again after their bodies had been taken from them through forced prostitution. So I reached out to this woman named Sohini Chakraborty, and I asked her for a Skype call. And that initial conversation led to my most recent documentary, which is called Little Stones. And I'd like to show you a clip from Little Stones now. So we are going to Lokhikantapur. We will be visiting Hashush, a shelter home, uh, anti-trafficking organization. And we run a dance movement therapy program over there. Today, actually, uh, we are working with this group. As I said, this is a mixed group. Like there is survivors of sex trafficking as well as other uh, survivors of sexual violence. So trafficking in itself, when we're looking at it, it's just the fact that someone is being exploited and someone else is benefiting from that. And it could be varied. I mean, it could be for labor, it could be for domestic work, but in sex trafficking, minor girls are being taken from their homes. Uh, young women are being forced to come out and be put into brothels, which are really absolute hell holes to be in, and then they're being forced to attend to these customers who come sometime 10, 15, 20 in a day. Madhur Korto, Kivo, Kuno Dagajache, Jeshomosto, Kastoma Rashe, Mane Tade, Mane Sexual J, J, Cigarette K, Cigarette Chakadila Hoche, Tade K, Mane Dito. Most of the children who are trafficked into the brothels and red light area, first they cut off from their body. The disconnection. They started to hate their body. Okay. Work with the body is so important because when the exploitation, when the violence, when the abuse, anything it's happened, it's a tremendous physical trauma. We really do not have that much tool available to work on the physical trauma. In the end, I decided to not only focus on Shohini, but also three other women who are using culture to create social change for women and girls around the world. Senegalese hip-hop star and activist Sister Fa rose to fame when she was just 19 years old as the country's first solo female rap artist. When she was in high school, Fatu discovered, as she put it, that she was not a complete woman because she had been cut or undergone female genital mutilation. Now, Sister Fa goes on tour throughout West Africa using her music to spark a dialogue around child marriage and genital cutting, and she's even started to work with the African diaspora community in her new home in Berlin, Germany. American fashion designer Anna Taylor first moved to Nairobi when she was in high school with her parents to volunteer. She went on to study apparel design at the University of Arkansas, 
And on winter break her sophomore year, she went back to Nairobi to visit her parents who were still living there. On that trip, she met an unemployed yet very talented seamstress named Judith, who just needed enough money to put three meals on the table and to send her kids to school. On that trip, Anna hatched a plan. She decided she would hire Judith to make clothing that she could sell to friends and family back in the United States, and she would give the proceeds back to Judith. Before Anna even graduated from the University of Arkansas, she was selected to show her clothing line named Judith and James after Judith at New York Fashion Week. Brazilian graffiti artist Pan Malacastro is one of the country's most famous graffiti artists in a traditionally male-dominated field. In 2004, Pen Mela's husband brutally beat her up and locked her in her home for three days. Eventually, she escaped, and she went to the police station, but the police said, sorry, there's nothing we can do, because at that time, Brazil did not have a law prohibiting domestic violence. Two years later, the Maria de Pena law was passed, named after a survivor who'd been shot multiple times by her then husband and left paralyzed. This law was celebrated by women's rights groups all over the world as this landmark legislation. There was only one problem. Most of the women who so desperately needed this law had no idea their rights had changed. So Panmela decided that she would use her graffiti art to raise awareness about this so-called private issue in the most public way possible, through street art. But she didn't stop there. Vocês entenderam o que vai acontecer hoje, tá certo? Meu nome é Pamela Castro, eu sou da ONG Redinami, que é um grupo formado por grafiteiras, né? Que a gente pinta a cidade para promover os direitos das mulheres. For me, it's very easy just to paint canvas, paint a wall, and be a famous artist. But when I came home and put my head in the pillow to sleep, I imagine all the women that suffering. How I will be a famous, nice, rich artist and ignore everything that's happened outside. And I decide to use this graffiti and the respect that I have in the graffiti to talk about something important. I work with you to create a mural of graffiti here in the school to promote the Lei Maria da Penha, to talk about domestic violence. Now, if I come to a community or to a school saying that I want to talk about domestic violence, people will not come. When you come and say that you will have a graffiti workshop, everybody wants to come. All the teenagers uh, go because they want a graffiti. But when begins the discussion, they all have stories. Aqui tem muito, tem muita violência doméstica. Tem até um caso de uma amiga minha que o namorado dela não queria que ela fosse com aquela roupa para o baile. Aí ela Chegou, desobedeceu ele, foi, ele achando que é o pai dela, mas é só um namorado. Chegando lá, chegou perto de ele sair da porta, ela sair para ir pro baile na porta, e ele foi lá e agrediu ela, deu um soco na cara dela e ela foi pro hospital. What I think is so powerful about what Penmela is doing is she's not only getting high school girls to talk about domestic violence. She's also getting boys in the room, because in Brazil, graffiti is cool, and all the guys want to learn graffiti from a famous graffiti artist. Now this gets to the heart of what I think is so powerful about all these women. They're using culture and the cultural resources available to them to create change around issues that others just thought one person probably couldn't have an impact on. Anna Taylor isn't just giving handouts to women in Nairobi. She's created a sustainable business model and path out of poverty through the export market, and she uses the proceeds of her business to fund a nonprofit sewing training program, which teaches women living in poverty how to sew for free. In West Africa, it's difficult to talk about female genital mutilation. Even in the United States, there's never a good time to bring it up, although in West Africa, it's considered taboo. 
Sister Fa has figured out how to take a difficult conversation and turn it into a joyful celebration. And that positivity leads people to a more open dialogue and allows them to maybe think about changing these deeply rooted cultural practices. In India, there's a long tradition of using dance, meditation, and holistic healing. There's also a profound lack of financial resources to provide therapy for the girls who are traumatized and marginalized because of their sexual trauma. Shohini has figured out a way to help provide cost-effective therapy in a really fun way through dance. And Panmela. In 2006, when the Brazilian domestic violence law was approved, only a small fraction of the population knew that this law had been passed. In recent polls, 97% of men and women in Brazil know about this law, and that's a huge leap in awareness in just a little over a decade. And Panmela and her brightly colored, very well-publicized graffiti art most certainly played a role. These women, Anna, Panmela, Shohini, and Sister Fa, they tell us something that those terrible statistics I mentioned earlier do not. Solutions. See, statistics are important because they help us understand what the issues are, but they don't tell us what we can do about it. And that's why sharing individual stories is so important. For example, do you think Shohini set out to help all 20 million survivors of forced prostitution globally? Probably not, but she's had a huge impact. Over 65,000 survivors in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh have all been helped by her dance therapy organization. And she's trained 63 survivors to become professional dance movement therapists, which does two things. One, those survivors are now going out and helping younger survivors. And two, they're earning a living wage, which means they will never go back to the brothel. Or... Do you think Anna worries about the estimated one billion people globally living on less than a dollar a day? Probably not, but she does worry about the three women she employs full-time, the over 200 contract workers she regularly hires, the 47 women who graduated from her Taylor training program, and her best friend, Judith, who now has enough money to send all nine of her children to school, and in one generation, is breaking the cycle of poverty. I do what I do because I believe these stories matter. These women are thinking outside the box and daring to dream up solutions that might seem far-fetched or maybe too small a scale to really have an impact. But what if every dance school in the United States offered a free class to survivors of sexual trauma? Or what if every business owner donated a percentage of their profits to fund nonprofit training programs? Or what if right here at the University of Michigan, we started a nationwide campus trend using the culture of sports to get more men excited about the women's movement? Imagine pep rallies with all of the famous athletes and even Coach Harbaugh speaking out and sharing personal stories about the women in their lives that make them want gender equality. Then we might see large-scale cultural change. We would also be the leaders in best. Thank you.